Today's episode of In the Trenches is brought to you by System 12 Guitar Method. Sign up today at RyanRoxy.com. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 and welcome to another live stream and our second Friday In the Trenches podcast. I am your host, Ryan Roxy. What is happening, folks? Um... You see by this big smile on my face, I'm in a good mood, man. I like these things on Fridays. Thank you, Vic, for having a completely different schedule and changing our whole entire In the Trenches podcast schedule around. I enjoy it. I'm in a good mood. I am. Why am I also I'm in a good mood? Oh, it's football season's right around the corner. That's one reason. And I'm pointing, pointing to things, folks. And if you're only not seeing it, you're only listening to it on either Apple Podcast or Spotify Podcast or whatever your favorite platform is, thank you very much. But you know what I'm going to say. I want you to go check out the live stream video feed that's in our uh, YouTube channel, which is Ryan Roxy Official. Because uh, you don't want to miss any of the live things that we point at, we show at, and we have pictures of, plus the live chat. And I can see the In the Trenches faithful in the live chat right now as we speak. Happy Friday to you. Um, and one more reason I'm happy is because I'm packing bags. Uh, this I'm actually getting ready for tour. Uh, the Alice Cooper tour is starting in just up in a little bit, depending on when you are listening to this podcast. Maybe we're already out there. But uh, yeah. So when you go out and you pack your bags, you you find things like a new hat or maybe a shirt, thank you very much, that was given to me on the last time we actually did a proper, proper tour, which was way back in 2019. But you know what? We did tour in 2020. But uh, enough about me. Enough of my yakking, right? Because on In the Trenches, I'm always happy to have inspiring friends here, um, especially when they have a new record coming out that we should all know about and you should all know about. Um, his newest release is called Bronx Cheer. And we will get to the bottom of that name, Bronx Cheer. Um, hopefully it's not as colorful as the Cleveland Steamer, but you never know. We will find out what it actually is. And here to talk about all things NYC rock and roll scene, one of the workhorses in the stable of the East Coast guitarist Legion. All right. Singer, songwriter. Producer, guitarist, of course, and friend, Mr. Steve Conti. Hello, Steve. <laughs> What's up, Ryan? All right, I'm not going to be cool and keep my glasses on. You could be as cool as you no, want. No, no, you no, don't dude. have to be. You just smelled your <laughs> armpit again. No, no, I wiped my Italian sweat from my face, man. <laughs> we were talking right it. before. I'm constantly smelling my armpits. I, I don't have the same reaction. Usually I'm like, oh. I need a shower, but but <laughs> today is Friday. I don't care. There's no showers today. I mean, in, in fact, when I leave and go back out on tour with Alice, there's probably no not that many showers, maybe <laughs> at all <laughs> anymore. Do you shower when you're on tour? Oh hell yeah. Um, really? Usually, well, usually in the, in the morning before. Sometimes I'm too sweaty at night, and I I can't even get to sleep. I'm so disgusted with myself. So I'll shower <laughs> before bed. But then, you know, you wake up and you got to do it all. You got to do your hair, of course, because it's like in the morning. See, you go to sleep my, on it my, wife, my wife has to shower every single day of things. So Mine too. Thing, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like every night before she goes to bed. It's a really good rule of thumb. So during this whole pandemic thing, I've gotten into that routine. But now I'm going to go back out on the road. So I'm going to probably become not a little shower? bit more of a road. You're going to sweat on stage and then not shower? I, I kind of, I don't know. I, is is it wrong? Is it wrong? No. Just to, to, I, I, I think after, if you're on the road for a couple of weeks, your body naturally has a musk that overtakes it. It's a musk. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, wasn't there actually a, a, a cologne called musk? Oh yeah. Back, in, back in when we oh, were. Uh, Jovan, Jovan musk. Remember? Oh, Jovan. Jovan. J O V A N. All right. I think it had a Before, little pump. All right. Before there was Savage, folks, there was Musk, and then there was then there's the actual Roxy Road Musk. M maybe that's the title of my fucking right. cologne, Roxy Road Musk. Come on, man, you gotta have a cologne. Everybody's got like you know, 
Dragon's got his, uh, well, you know, the Wild Hearts got their hot sauce, and Dragon's got his beer. Beer, and, that's right, you know, that's right. Motorhead's got their vodka, and, you know. Steve, if I'm I could have, get I'm one I'm going to have my Italian sauce at some point. <laughs> you know what you should have, Steve? You should have hair products, because you do have I the finest think, head of hair in rock and roll. I one of the think, finest heads. I did think about that, actually. You know, but it would if, probably be like just putting your name on, on some other product, like slapping a label over, a, you know, my favorite hair product. You know? But wait a second. All right, Steve. I, you're going to say heritage. You're going to say it's your Italian uh, background. But what is the secret behind I don't the know, killer man. rock and roll hair? It's all mine. It's all no, yours. No weaves, no extensions. Uh, is... A little bit of color. I, 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 we, all, we put some color in it. Me, you know, I'm, I'm no think, stranger uh, to putting color in. I think there's a little bit of gray in there. But not much. <laughs> you missed you know. a spot. <laughs> <laughs> that's why folks you got to get on the ryan roxy official youtube channel to check out uh, steve conti's hairline if anything for this podcast if we got it's one of the best hairlines out there um i know vic we hear that echo everybody hears it so just do what i said just maybe mute that mic and then unmute it i might have something to do with it it's all right what no comments about the hair and the, the you know you're not going crazy you want to hear about rock and roll you want to hear about guitars is that what you want to do well you came to the right podcast because that's what we're going to do we're going to go back to get forward with steve conti how about that yeah. Come Damn. on, baby time baby time when i give that no you guys are fancy we try to be. We try to be. We try to have a little and animation. I, and, I'm, and I must say, uh, your your team that uh, posts on social media yeah, are yeah. amazing. Federica, Kanak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, can see, I can see them. They're in there right now. That we we've got Anders in there. I see Fred. I, be, I mean, you guys out there, honestly. Uh, Moss guy, all you guys that post in and post out. Of course, Federica runs the social media for ITT and for all things Roxy. And uh, we thank you, everybody, for promoting the um, podcast and telling it to more friends. But you got to keep on doing that. Keep on putting it out, peep, spreading the word. Are you doing laundry right now, Steve, as we no, do the podcast? Uh, you know, I, decided, I, I decided I don't want to look like I'm smelling my armpit all the time, so I'm just going <laughs> to I'm gonna wipe my face with one of my T-shirts. That is clever marketing. Now you see that? Look at that. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm it's, learning from you already. <laughs> now let's let, take a look at that shirt because you have it on, but I have we it can't on see yeah. the camera. There it is. But then obviously you made more than one. So that one. one is for somebody. Um, is that for the new record or no, is that? For, no, this oh. is this was for the album called Steve County NYC. There you go. There it is. You're very fast, Quick. Vic. Um, he's quick on that i don't and, know about uh, the going back to get forward segment but he was quick on that <laughs> double <laughs> double flip offs from vic behind the scenes <laughs> yeah i just found a uh i just found a, a shitload can i say that yeah of, sure, you uh, say whatever uh, the fuck you want fucking a of new old stock i was cleaning out my uh, storage space and i found like a whole bunch of these uh, unfortunately of course, dudes, you know, writing me, oh, man, I want two double XLs. They're the first ones to go. So, you know, double XL shirts just. Oh, yeah. For I the men's. But I have tons of ladies shirts. So, so is, uh, there, is there a fire sale going on at SteveConti.com? Yeah, is that there's what's happening a, right now? Yeah, there's a bit of a sale going on. A little clearance. And, uh, yeah. I love it. Because I'm going to I'm going to make um, I'm going to make look at what I just did. I <laughs> got my shirt and I wipe my stuff on my armpit. Um, it's because it's hot in here. If I can turn my AC on, I won't have to do that. But do whatever you got to do, dude. If, if you want to do laundry, you want to open the door. I mean, I can tell you're in your music room. You're sort of in the man cave music room. I, I see the guitars hanging on the hooks. Yes. I love it. I love it. My man cave, and my, my Wurlitzer, my guitars, uh, which we can talk about in a minute. Well, those are just Those are just three of my newer ones, of course. But um, I'm yeah. I'm going to take a wild stab at it because you are so East Coast and even to pinpoint it even more, your Jersey, your NYC, your I'm going to say you're in New York. Am I right? Right now? Yeah. I'm in the Bronx. The Bronx. I love it. So you're even you're in one of the boroughs. And oh, I, yeah. I, I think the Bronx is kind of like sort of the forgotten borough. It doesn't that's, get in. A, that's why I moved here. Uh, I mean, I was in Manhattan for 30 years, and six years ago, needed more space, wanted my own man cave like this, where I have, you can't see it, but I have all my recording gear, 
have my mic trees, I have my speakers here, oh, my yeah. mic over here. Um, you know, I wanted my own room. And uh, so we got a three bedroom place in the Bronx and it's amazing. You know, there's yeah. lots of hills. Like the storm that we just had here where everybody was getting flooded, we're on a hill. Okay. It's so mountainous around here that no, no water collected at all. I mean, we had zero, uh, um, you know, problems during the. Yeah, storm. I mean, that room you're in right now would be called a mansion in uh, Manhattan. Oh, that yeah. would be a Man Manhattan mansion. Oh God, <laughs> if people live in apartments this size. This it size would only be. Mansion. It would. It would only be five grand a month too for rent for that room. I love it. <laughs> I'm telling you, you know the. Well, I had a sweet deal in Manhattan. That's why I stayed in the same apartment for 30 years, but. Rent um, control, baby, right? Yeah, we're stabilized. But uh -huh. after uh, after that, you know, uh, I mean, to get, I went from a one bedroom to three bedrooms. You know, well, so my uh, my sons have one, me and my wife have one, and this is my love it, love it. The thing story. is, I I do think that the Bronx is one of the forgotten boroughs, and like I said on the on the In the Trenches podcast, you'll not only hear about rock and roll guitars, but you'll also hear some geography. And one of the boroughs. Now, let me ask you this: Is Yonkers considered a borough, or is just Yonkers no. considered just a part of no. the Bronx? No, it's not even part of. The, I don't believe it's part of the Bronx. I think it's, it's above. West, it's above I think the it's Bronx. In Westchester County, technically. Okay. But um, like I'm in one of the last. Uh, towns in the Bronx. I think once you get too m much above me, then you're in White Plains, Yonkers, you know, okay. uh, New Rochelle, Pelham, yeah, yeah. up there. We played plenty of rock shows up there, man. Yeah. Plenty so, of club shows. I mean, that's the thing going back to get forward. We have a history of being East Coast. Um, we were actually on the same label. I'm not sure if you remember this, but I uh, believe we were. I think Electric you guys Angels? were Electric Angels was on guys, Atlantic Atlantic Records. Oh, I believe Company of Wolves was on Atlantic Records. Am I no, right? No, we were on Mercury. But I remember, and I'm what, wrong. <laughs> I remember what happened though. Um, well, first of all, I remember we never met back then. No, but, uh, the Electric Angels and Company of Wolves would play at the Cat Club all the time. Okay, with probably probably a Nikki Camp production yes, or something Nikki like that, Camp. or Don Don Hill. Don and Hill. Nikki Camp. Uh, I love Don. I, I miss that. Rest guy, his man. soul. Really he sweet was, guy. Positive was, energy. Yes, and he was really so supportive of of you know all music, but especially anything I did. Anytime I had a new band or I wanted to try something out, he yeah, come on down. And he always paid me, and it was never like this cheap shit. You know, club owner. Ah, how many people are you gonna bring? It was always like. Come on in, man. Try, you know he respected talent. Oh, look back at you, the, man! You're searching. Back in the day, that, that looks that's to me. Jacks. That's Hammerjacks. Yeah, that's Hammerjacks in Baltimore. In Baltimore, Do, yeah. That's don't look for it, folks. It's not there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Electric banana. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's exactly. That's uh, that's my singer Keith Brewer. That's where he was from. My uh -huh. singer. Huh. My singer. Come on, punch Ooh. me in the jaw. Yeah, that's where they. <laughs> that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. So. Stay on that picture just for a second, folks, so you can all just take it in. Take it in. It was before social distancing. It was before, it was before uh, social media. <laughs> yeah, before social media, before social distancing. And I, I think Michelob was actually a, a beer company at that point. I don't even know if they make beer anymore. Who it was knows? A beer that people drank, uh, unfortunately. Okay. We'll go back to that picture again, please, Vic. Um, and I'm just trying to point out, uh, see those big square things that are on the stage right now, folks? Those are called monitors. Right. And that was before people had stuck things in their ears so they could hear everything. They had these other speakers that would blast sound. And that's probably the reason why I'm a little deaf to this day is because we had monitors and side fills and all that kind of great stuff. Huh? But if that was Hammerjacks, what? I remember that was the bar. Well, obviously, the band that owned that bar was, or, you know, didn't own it, but they, they ruled Baltimore area was Kicks. Kicks, yeah. Kicks? Yeah, yeah. Of course. So Got I think we played, we, we played with them there, I believe, and we also played with Danger Danger down there. Oh, yeah. I, I, remember, I remember that club, but like, like 28 bars or something like that, 23 bars, something like that. In Baltimore? Yeah, the kicks. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hammerjacks. It didn't have like a million different types of individual bars oh. all throughout the club. Or you never yeah. went out there. Uh, you know, I, 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 rem I think I walked on one of them with my guitar when I first got a wireless. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I don't remember how many bars they had. 
But I was um, almost going to say it was before wirelesses, but no, they definitely no, had wirelesses. By then. No, I definitely had my first wireless then, which totally sucked. I remember turning the volume knob and it would go. <laughs> was it? A and Navy? pretty soon I just got rid of it. I said, screw this, man. But back in those days, I'll there was the two cable. choices. Nady Wireless or Samson? Which one was it? Yes. Uh, I went with another company called, what the heck was it? Uh, All right. <laughs> it, it was, you never heard of it. All right. I'm sure you never heard of it, and we never heard of it since. So well, you know, Is, is Nady Wireless is still out there? Yeah, I, I think have to be. I don't know. No? I, I, I don't, I mean, I use a wireless with Monroe, but it's whatever they got an endorsement for, whatever they bought yeah. for the band. We, uh, we really use Sure Wirelesses with Alice and stuff. Sure, yeah. Maybe it's Sure or it's another uh, a well-known company like JBL or right on. Genelec or somebody makes speakers, I think. I don't know. We're, we're going to talk about all things um, Michael Monroe and all things. I know, Vic, we have this problem with the Echo. He's like I this grimace from my producer, but I don't know. We're trying to just figure it out. We're going to do it. It's a podcast, folks. You, they, you understand people, don't you, in the chat? Sometimes we have echoes. It's okay. Um, but we're going back to get forward. We're going. I'm going to go back a little bit further than Hammerjacks and a little bit further than uh, Company of Wolves. I want to go back to when you first uh, started playing because you come from a musical family. You come from pedigree, right? Your parents play music. Obviously, look at that. Oh, oh hey, Vic. I'm so sorry I didn't send you a, a, a kid picture, but it looks like you found one. That's me on <laughs> drums. And my brother on guitar. That was our original. Uh, those were our original instruments. And then, um, when did you make the switch to from drums to guitar? Because I did the same sort of thing. I, I started on drums as well. Oh, wait, yeah, there's me. See, where the are you? Over the eyes, right there, with the snare drum in front. Oh, you got the cool instrument with a wood block too. Look yeah, at dude. you. Yeah, drummer I mean, with I was, a wood I was, block. I was a pretty good drummer because you know you had to be at a certain level to play snare drum. You know, yeah, my first couple of years in the marching band, I played timpani. But can you marching imagine timpani? marching? Can you imagine marching I, with a timpani? I did it. That's what yeah. I did. I was the marching timpani, and and then the what small. are the three drums? Oh, the, boom, the, boom. the, the roto triples. toms. Triples. Yeah, they were, were they called timbales, or, or you, was it called them? the? It, yeah, it was you could you could uh, they turned and they they would uh, actually tune and detune. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. Roto toms. Yeah, yeah. Roto toms. So I did that, and and just like you, I was a timpani player. But uh, then you moved up to the snare line. Congratulations. Yeah. I, that was like that might have been my senior year. So I was already seventeen. I was already playing guitar by then. But you know, I still had one foot. In the drum. Where, where do you go from there? Where, yeah, where do you yeah. go? Where do you go from snare drum? Well, nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah, nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, back to guitar. So yeah, the uh, in that kid picture you first saw, um, I may have, uh, I, we may have have already made the switch by this time, but right. um, that's my brother's first guitar, and I picked we, it up one day and realized without a pick, I was playing with my uh, my index fingernail right as a pick and uh i wrote a song on one on the low e string just like a bass line da, 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 da. i was like hey uh, one words. string yeah one string it was just yep. like kind of a bass line but i wrote a whole song and then i wrote another song then i wrote another song i was like hey man i can write i don't even know what i'm doing and i can write songs it's like <laughs> I, i'm not just gonna bang on things and be stuck in the back i need to be up front so I started taking well, guitar you, lessons. And also, in all fairness, in that photo, if you go back to that early photo of you, um, you have a, you're have screaming to get out in front because you have a little bit of a Liam Gallagher vibe right there as well. You know, it's kind of like, well, or, let or, me or, get or, in the front. Let me get in the front. That's or Slim Jim, Slim Jim Phantom way before, <laughs> right? He stands Slim playing. Jim? He plays standing up. Yeah, and, uh, of course I, he does. I was playing standing up. Well, Slim Jim actually st sits down too, and that's I, I had the pleasure of playing with him for many, many years when he uh, sat down. Because when he sits down, he he becomes very salty and grumpy and yells at you, especially if you're playing his club, the Cat Club. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and you yourself are taking advantage of all the free alcohol. So that yeah, maybe that was the reason why he was so salty. At me. But he, but you know what? We love Jim. We love Slim Jim Phantom, and I'm glad that he inspired you to move on to guitar because guitar ended up being a great choice for you right Look yeah i mean it was uh you know it was necessary i thought 
to be a songwriter, you can't be stuck behind the drums. Of course, you know, there are drummers that are Don Henley and, you know, people like that, Phil Collins, you know, that have had great careers as drummers and lead singers, songwriters. But but there's guys the time, that get, get behind the drums or they start with the drums and then kind of get in the front and then they get even crazier fame like Dave Grohl or, you yeah, know, or perhaps Grohl, yeah, hello, Steve hello. Tyler, Stephen yeah. Tyler. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so many people that we know that we've had on the podcast started with drums and they moved on uh, and they eventually got in that front line. And the thing is, if you go back to that picture, the thing that strikes me is that you've always know that one of the two, you and your brother, um, you and your brother have been sort of staples all from, you know, he switched to bass. Uh, Vic, if you can put that photo up of... Uh, playing bass and stuff there yep. he goes that was definitely at a talent show um yep. he had switched to bass at that point but you guys have been intertwined uh guitar and bass for many many years was he your inspiration or were you his inspiration or did it just feed off each other he's a year younger than me and we both at the same time listened to the beatles revolver and went what you know, because so it was, we, Revolver was your album. Yeah, okay. we had been listening to the pop radio, whatever. I mean, we heard rock and roll on the radio. You know, we heard The Who and Small Faces. And, you know, they, they played. Some, we lived in Buffalo at the time. I'm from upstate New York originally. Okay. So we lived in Buffalo from like when I was in kindergarten until about fourth grade. And then we moved down here outside of New York City, about 50 minutes outside in, in Jersey. But, uh, Buffalo, they had a great radio station up there, WKBW, and they played, I remember here and I can see for miles, and, you know, Ichiku Park by the Small Faces, you know, the Who, the Hollies, Carrie Ann, all those great, like, kind of, you know, power pop, melodic songs, which I think yeah. got into my head early on. But then mm -hmm. we heard Revolver, and, like, Tomorrow Never Knows, and She Said, She Said, these, like, sonic weirdnesses that we'd never heard before, and we would we would just sit there and stare at the album cover, you know, with, with there's pictures of them all in each other's hair. And we're like, who's this? Is that Ringo? Is that, you know, we'd be trying to like match up. No, that's John. It was, so, it was you so know what? fascinating. It's, it's, you know? it's, it's freaky how many times the Beatles will come up as the, the, the one that made it, you know, and we've had some, we've had some more classic guests that come on and they say, you know, I saw, uh, Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, or that was the the, the life changing moment. And but it's always a Beatles reference that really got us into it. And for me, it was I, I guess I would say my next door neighbor uh, Adam. Him and I used to sit on his couch, and his parents had the White Album, and we would he would we would I would play Tupperware um, with 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 wooden spoons on the drums and he would you know and we would just mime that album so it's amazing yeah. that the beatles have such huge influence for launching so many careers who is that band now who do you think the band who's that first band that people listen to and go oh my god the first time i heard that do you mean rock band or pop band <laughs> whatever whatever band that comes out like who what band do does like a 12 year old kid or even younger because you were younger and i was younger when we first heard those albums what what is it that it just really grabs them? What is that band or what is that album? Is it you know? Could it be Appetite for Destruction for you know some people, or could it be you know well, what is the classic album or is it Nevermind by by Nirvana? Well, my twelve year old son um, really got into Green Day as far as rock goes. He got into Green Day. Um, who else? Stuff that I turned him on to, but generally, I mean, he's a really good singer and songwriter. So I've been working with him, writing, producing him. We've been doing demos since he was probably seven or eight. He's 12 now. That's um, amazing. You're, ta you're literally passing the torch on to the next generation. Yeah. That happens to be your son. Yeah. That's great. And, uh, and, and, but but now, he really likes pop music. He likes like Shawn Mendes and, um, uh, you know, he likes Bieber, I guess. And you know, Well, dude, like when, I was, when I was growing up, it was David Cassidy. Uh, yeah. Tony De, Tony DeFranco and the DeFranco family. I beat it to love beat. Yeah, the Osmond brothers. <laughs> yeah, you know, so so I love that sugary pop too. Bobby Sherman. If Bobby you will. Sherman, yes, and uh, uh, who and, else? Uh, uh, the Jacksons, of course. Jackson Five. Yeah, absolutely, Jackson, Jackson Five. Five. But you, you know, those, you know, those, Vic, those Vic, like, are, oh, go ahead. Those were like the kiddie, you know, the kid groups. But, but uh, you know, on the same radio stations, 
we would hear, you know, the Jackson Five and you know, AM radio. They had almost had like no format at all. So we'd hear the Jackson Five, like ABC, and then Hold Our Love, you know, yeah. and a bridge and version Led of, of Led Zeppelin's Hold Our Love, you yeah. know, in, on the same station. It was crazy. It sounds like it, it, outside Buffalo and outside of San Francisco, where I grew up, we had the same sort of radio programmers because I would literally hear the Commodores next to Cheap Trick. You know, yeah. which was was a, a great con a great way to grow up. But Dookie is it? You know, uh, Carousel Vertigo. It's exactly Dookie is one of those albums. I think that's probably for kids. Green maybe Day. something. It's Green Day. It, it yeah. just gets it, you know inspires them right now. Um, Not to uh, mention your, the, the, Vic, the title. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're talking about all, titles, it's all about the poop and fart jokes, you know. Well, about. let's talk. Yeah. With, we're going to talk well, about the Bronx I, cheer. I, I, that, actually, that, if you want to get. My, Actually, with my five-year-old, is more about those. With my twelve-year-old, now it's like uh, it's even saltier. Uh, well, let's solve the mystery then. Being that you've already talked about poop and fart jokes, so let's solve the mystery of what the hell is a Bronx cheer. You're not besides just being your new album because there it is, Steve Conti, Bronx cheer. Uh, is is it similar to a Cleveland steamer or what is it? Well, I'm not sure what a Cleveland steamer is, but <laughs> you're not. <laughs> don't google it don't google it is that it. anything like a dutch oven it's, it's a, maybe a little more intense okay a little it's bit, like a little a, bit more like, german it's not like a dirty sanchez or anything is it it's okay now you're getting warm i'm getting warm getting... <laughs> all right well maybe uh maybe we should cut it right there. <laughs> what's the bronx cheer i want to know right, so well a bronx cheer is technically a you know it's a raspberry right okay just go and... a fart noise yeah. Okay, fart noise. But um, the album uh, cover, as you saw, mm -hmm. has you know this real angry kid. And actually, what he's doing is that was taken during an anti-Trump protest on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. And it was um, taken what year? Because it looks like it could be from the 1930s, right? 2016. So the kid wow. is uh, he's what? Do the math you know, 20, 22 now, 21. Yeah. Um, but uh, so when I saw that picture and I saw that that's what he was protesting, I went, yes, that's, <laughs> my, that's my man. So, uh, and the fact that, you know, it's, it's brunch cheer, but he looks really angry. It is like yeah, a nice yeah. contrast is what I like. But I also well, like that he's, that the name brunch cheer, it's uh, giving a nice, Fat I think it, it has a whole vibe to it, and I like the fact. If you can go back to that album cover, Vic, I like the fact that it looks like it comes from a different era. It looks like it comes from a completely different time because you did the sepia tone type of artwork. Whoever did the artwork on the album, great job on it. You know, yeah, it's Rich Jones did the artwork, um, but it was a photo by a guy named Andre Kudaki. I actually saw the picture, the photo in New York Magazine, and I was like, oh, I got to find out how to get in touch with this guy. I googled him. I tracked him down. He was living in Sweden, actually. Yeah. He's okay. a South American guy. He's like from Colombia or somewhere, but he's living in Sweden. And uh, so, you know, we, we worked out an agreement and, uh, and then we, we kind of changed the cover a bit because there was a lot of, there was a lot of faces you could recognize in the background there. And I couldn't get in touch with those people to, to get release forms. So he just blurred them out. Yeah. We actually, some of the people who were a little more recognizable, we actually changed their heads. <laughs> <laughs> like this guy directly to his right if you're looking at it that that's oh, yeah. not even the guy's real face okay and the guy behind him too because we couldn't find them so well here's the like, thing i just hope in 10 years that that kid doesn't come and uh, sue you for sexual exploitation <laughs> no <laughs> i got him to sign a release form all right, all right. see that's hey, what you did, which on, Nirvana Kurt. must not have. Now, what what was that? It just happened a couple a couple weeks ago, where where the the uh, kid the from, from the Nirvana album, yeah, from yeah. Nevermind, and he says it's completely affected his way, his his life. But I I think it's affected it in a cool way because uh, what a what a better way to like close a deal on someone? Go, hey, you've seen me naked already. What? <laughs> You know, you've seen me naked. You've already seen me naked. What, what do you mean? And then you show him the album cover. And it's kind of like you know, it's 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 the closer. I don't know. I, I, I kind of. But you know the way the way uh, Americans are. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't want to minimize the kid's problems if he's really had any. But 
let's face it, Americans love to sue people. They love to sue. And they love, love, they to, love to try and get some money for, <laughs> you know, whatever happens. Or maybe it was just a ploy to get more followers for Instagram. I don't know, man. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's seriously things. But the thing is, the fact that it happened and they didn't sign a release, who would have signed a release? The baby couldn't the sign them. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. made the baby sign a release. <laughs> He could have peed on the paper. <laughs> you made the dog pay. Why am I doing all these quotes from like, whether it's fucking Spinal Tap or whatever? It's because I'm getting along. We come from the same era, Steve. Yeah, dude. That's why. I know. Oh, man. And the cat club. Well, oh, my God. The New York cat Don club. Don Hill. You know what? Let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a, a little toast to, to Don Hill because he was great. You know, he really was. I know yeah. it's a little bit earlier uh, for you in the day, but thanks for taking the time, Steve. Um, we're we're going to move on a little bit. Um, like, like I always say that, but I, I just love to fucking talk about the old school days um, of New York city. And, you know, being that I came there uh, and, and the rest of the band electric angels came, you know, we gravitated from LA to New York, which at the time wasn't, what you did you, that's maybe why we had a bit of success that way because we were going to swimming against the tide um but you were stationed there at that point and you had kind of really made a a mark in in new york um what what do you think was the turning point that got you into getting all the connections because i know it's you and your brother were jamming you were playing but was there a certain artist that like really opened the door for you to get into this sort of studio playing and studio musician type of career that you were building up? Yeah. So uh, if I had to like, I can trace all of my success back to one guy and it's, <laughs> and it's a guy, <laughs> this is funny. It's a guy I went to, uh, when I was going to college at Rutgers, uh, I met this, guy named Jigs. He's got a band called Jigs and the Pigs. It was a punk band. And Jigs you know, and I was the there pigs. like like trying to be a real guitar player, you know, like studying West Montgomery and you know, I wanted yeah. to be a jazz player at that time. And uh I met this punk rock kid and we became friends. Actually we were dating um we were dating two girls that were best friends. That's how we met. Okay. And turns out, you know, years after college, I moved to New York and Oh, oh, he uh, introduces me to his brother-in-law, a guy named Glenn Burtnick. You know Glenn? Of course, man. So, Glenn, I would, actually, Glenn Burtnick is one of the guys that I was trying to write songs like his, like, on the on the West Coast because he had this amazing pop sensibility yeah. with, and, and great vibe. So, okay, that was his yeah. brother? So, yeah, it was his brother-in-law. So brother he okay. introduced me to Glenn, and I joined Glenn's band, and did uh, my first MTV video in 1987, maybe. Um, what song follow, was it for? Because I think I saw Follow You. Oh, yes. I said, I'll follow you. Yeah. So, uh, and the drummer in that band was Jimmy Clark. You okay. know Jimmy? Jimmy, Jimmy Clark. Who, who, who would end up. Everybody. Jimmy would end up being the drummer in Demolition 23 with Michael Monroe and Sammy Affa. Wow. Um, and he's now, um, that's Rich Jones. He would, uh, he's now uh, Metallica's uh, drum tech. He, he texts for Lars. But uh, yeah. so Jimmy, um, uh, I'm, I'll try and get through this quick. No, no, I like the, I like the I like this sort of twists and turns because they all open doors for later bands that you played in. Yeah, it's incredible. Jimmy, Jigs. the drummer, after I left the part of ways with Glenn, Jimmy dragged me into a project with his then girlfriend, this girl called Robin Beck, and we used to rehearse at Top Cat Studios. Remember Top Cat on Twenty Eighth Street? I, I do. I've I've been there. I, yeah. I rehearsed there. Yeah. So sure. we uh, we rehearsed there, and um, she brought her producer down, this guy Jeff Kent, uh, who had been in a New York band called Dreams. They were like kind of blood, sweat, and tears before blood, sweat, and tears. They had the Brecker Brothers on horns. They were like a jazz rock, early '70s, late '60s band, and he. Uh, Jeff started like putting me on sessions, uh, commercials, demos, whatever. I started getting session work because of him. And then I had a blues band called the Hudson River Rats, and I told Jeff about it. He was like, 
yeah, I've been wanting to start a blues night, like a blues jam night. Uh, would you be interested in that? I said, yeah, let's do it. So Did you want every, to start it down in the village? Is that where you, you wanted to start the club at? Um, yes. So we went to the uh, under Acme, Acme Barn Grill on Great Jones Street. Okay. And uh, we played every Wednesday night, or no, every Monday night. Was it Wednesday or Monday? Uh, for <laughs> like two years. And the word it was got a residency. out. Yeah, it was a residency. The word got out after a year, and the people who would come down were incredible. Carol King came and jammed with us. Cindy Lauper, Phoebe Snow was a regular. All the Blues Brothers musicians, Will Lee, uh, Lou Marini. Um, so you're, you're amassing this credibility because, yeah. as, as, and you already had the door gets open because they say, oh, well, this this great band, you know, studio musician, go down and check out the, go down and check there out the are. jam. Oh, is, that at, is that at the jam or is that a different no, place? that's though? a different band. That's uh, <laughs> That was a band called the Bayonne Bleeders that I had okay. for, for a minute. I think we did two gigs at the Cafe Wa and then. Uh, for a New York up. minute. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay. Phoebe Snow singing. But um so, like, all these players came down. Even Willie DeVille, who I would later end up playing with, came down and jammed with us. David Johansson. Did you with was... Willie DeVille? Yeah, I, I, was in, I was in Willie's band. I might have seen you then and not known about it because I used to go see Willie DeVille um, at the Roadhouse up on 53rd Street. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you ever if you, 52nd Street. I don't know if you ever played any of those shows that he no, did. No, I, I love the okay. Roadhouse. I used to go there all the time. But, no, I didn't yeah. play with Willie. I did uh, a European tour with him. Okay. That's where I met my wife. Actually. Such, such great songs. Yeah. Mink, if it, Mink folks, Mink I mean, if you if you can, yeah, if you can r jot down some of these names, if you're watching this podcast, if you're listening to it, if you're watching it, thank you very much. But if you're listening to it, uh, get on over to the Ryan Roxy YouTube official channel and make sure you hit that subscribe button. But uh, yes, yeah, a lot of these sort of Easter eggs that we give you when we're just talking names and stuff are such amazing artists. Uh, Willie DeVille, I don't think it's enough credit for being no. As great a guitar player and a or, or songwriter Singer. as he was, you know, he, and vibe wise, I mean, the vibe well, of the Johnny style. Thunders, the style, the vibe of Johnny Thunders, a little bit, just like just cool ex rock and roll and stuff. And I don't know if you have any Johnny Thunder stories. Did I don't. Ever... I never met never met Thunders, but okay. uh, but anyway, back to you know Willie and and David Johansson would come down to jam with us. As, Lead uh, singer the, of New York Dolls, yeah. Yeah, but he was but, Buster Poindexter at the time, so he'd come with his, you know, pompadour and his suit. And, and we had uh, uh, Julian Lennon, I mean, people, from, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's keyboard player, just, you know, it was the who's who of New York City musicians. So people started, um, you know, calling me for session work and commercials, and, and that's where I actually met Keith, Jeff Kent, this, this guy I mentioned. He brought, he said, hey, I, I got this singer you should meet, and he's a great songwriter and you know he he loves the beatles like you and and tom petty and and so we got together and uh he came down to the blues jam and we jammed and then he came and over to my house we wrote our first uh like we wrote half of our first album in in the first week we didn't even think about having a band yet we were just like writing songs together and we were like hey wow we should start a band i said i know a bass player my brother He's like, I, I know a drummer, Frankie LaRocca, who was the a and guy for Atlantic. And that's where you got confused with the Atlantic thing because we that's did. That's right, because he was a, working at Atlantic yes, during that we time. we had a demo. We had a demo deal with Atlantic. Okay. So we recorded like whatever, five songs, and then oh, yeah. Atlantic passed. And we were like, good. So we got a great demo out of it. Now we're going to take <laughs> it around. And we took it around, and there it became this bidding war and like – Capital and Mercury and all these companies came out and we went with Mercury because we thought oh, they're a great rock and roll label. You know, they got Kiss and the Scorpions and, you know, yeah. but uh, at that it, time, it, Atlantic was a pretty big rock and roll label as yeah. well. I mean, everybody was. I mean, it was. Let's be honest. It was Atco, Mercury, Atlantic. Every everybody had some sort of rock bands because rock was in vogue back then. You know, yeah. no doubt well, I'm about talking it. 1988, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly we got signed in 89 and uh and you know after that um you know we we went on tour and and did a second album that didn't come out the, the first album came out in 1990 on mercury second album didn't come out and then uh we you know because seattle happened everybody wanted to have guys with yeah. flannels and uh, long shorts and you know 
beards. And uh, East Coast kind of got we East Coast got a little bit left behind on that on that ride because I remember the day it kind of happened, the day that uh, Nevermind came out. To be honest with you, I was listening to it and I going, "This album's going to change the fucking world. It's going to change a lot of things, man." It's gonna, because to me, they just made a really dirty, gritty, sleazy sounding cheap trick record. Which I loved, you know. So it's yeah. like poppy songs, but with like like eight guitars instead of two. <laughs> yeah, and you could hear Kurt turning on and off the distortion pedal, like in uh, in Bloom. Yeah, well, yeah. You, know? you can hear yeah. the, the pedal go on and off, or or is it? Uh, I, I think it's Teen Spirit actually. You can hear it click off right before that, right before the verse when it gets quiet. It's probably Butch Vig putting the uh, distortion box on because I, I think <laughs> it's it's funny when I hear and I read articles now how you know people say yeah, Kurt didn't really like you know never mind and I was like well you know don't bite the hand that feeds because that opened the door to everything else that you were able to do art artistically because that that album was the perfect album for the perfect time. You know, yeah. sometimes you get those perfect storm type of records and stuff. So you're you're meeting all these people, uh, Steve. You're jamming with them, but you're you know, again, one band is leading to another. So you know, it, it can it could go back to jigs, but then I I feel that uh, um, Sam Yaffa had something to do with you getting into a few of these other type of situations. Am I right? Yeah, there's a big chunk in between that. Oh, that you let's missed, go to the but, chunk. Let's see the chunk. If you want to hear the chunk. Right, well, here's the chunk. So, so after Company of Wolves, Billy Squire heard the Company of Wolves record, and he said, who's that guy? I want him to play guitar and sing on my record. It was his last record for Capitol called Tell the Truth. Really good record. So me and Keith, the singer from the Wolves, we uh, sang all the backgrounds, and I played guitar on a bunch of songs. And... Um, uh, because, oh, I know why, because Gary Lyons, the guy who produced our second Wolves record, was working with Billy. And Billy Squire, I, again, Don't Say No, that album, it, it, like, like again, one of those just must-hears. I think it's one, one of the more underrated sort of artists over the years. Get, 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 get kind of, kind of, uh, kind of, kind of lambasted for one stupid video. Yeah, one video, yeah. Yeah, one video, and then it's kind of like, eh, but you yeah, know, but the thing is, off, which is ridiculous. but the thing is, the fucking guy wrote great songs. Oh, he did great songs, and and I ended up going on tour with him too. I I toured on the twentieth. There it is, the twentieth anniversary of Don't Say No album was uh, in two thousand because that came out in eighty. So uh, I did that twentieth anniversary tour with him, and um, you know that led me places. I ended up working with Peter Wolf after that from Jay Giles, who was one of my favorite you know, childhood bands. Um, and I ended up working with Paul Simon. Damn. Uh, I was Paul you, Simon's vocal stand in for 10 years for rehearsals. So there you go. Whatever, uh, vocal whatever. stand in. Yeah, Wait I, was a like second. His, I was like his stunt singer, you know? So, <laughs> so in rehearsals, when Paul didn't want to sing, he would go, I'm going to take a rest, uh, bridge over troubled water. You take it, Steve. And could, could you, could you maybe say you were the fluff girl for Paul? Simon, <laughs> oh, <come> on. <laughs> on the mic, just on the mic. You were just fluffing the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he had his own mic. <laughs> no, so Paul would be, you know, set up in, in the middle of the band. I'd be off to the side with my uh, music stand and like, you know, tons of like lyric books and sheet music, you know, because he would have to get the right melodies and all that. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Learn, you, you learned all those songs. I learned anyway. all the songs. And let me tell you, they're not easy. I mean, there's some like that Rhythm of the Saints album. With, with all the Brazilian musicians, there's some shit. Oh, yeah. It's like an 11, eight, you know, and like nine, eight, all these weird time signatures. And, you know, he had three percussionists and Steve Gadd on drums and just this incredible band. Um, and then I also did Simon and Garfunkel where he had Jim Keltner on drums and Pino Palladino on bass. And, uh, you know, sometimes art yeah. wouldn't show up and we'd do a duet. So it would be Simon and Conti. I'd sing Scarborough uh, Fair or, or Simon uh, and Conti. Yeah, or Art it. wouldn't show up, or Paul wouldn't show up one day, and it'd be Conti and Garfunkel. You know, we'd do Sounds of Silence. I'd take Paul's part. Art would sing. You know, it was crazy. That's but the I ultimate had, in the trenches sort of uh, guest, folks, that we have today. Because you know what, you have been basically seven. You know, not even seven degrees. You've been like you know two or three degrees from every single fucking 
genre of there's, huge there's guys. Peter and there you are in the studio Peter right Wolf. now. Is that that Peter is Wolf that, over in the right corner with the sunglasses on next to Curtis King, the dark skinned gentleman. Great. Okay. Uh, he's also a great singer. And that's and Kenny White, the producer with the shades on, and my brother next to him. Yeah, I just happened mm -hmm. to uh, walk. My brother was recording with Peter, and, and I said, oh, I can't believe you're recording with Peter Wolf. You know how big of a hero he is of mine. You know, I just loved Wolf from, like, Bloodshot. You know, I had the red vinyl, Jay Giles' band, when Give It To Me came out, you know. And I was like, man, I, I wish I could meet him. He's like, just stop by the studio one day. So I, I stopped by in that room right there. And uh, someone threw a guitar into my hand, and I started playing, and Peter started singing. And next thing That's I knew, amazing. I was playing. He's going, you know that song? I was playing, like, these old Jay Giles songs. And he's like, man, we got to get this guy on the record. So the next day, they booked me, and I came in, and I played guitar. Uh, uh, me on one track and Cornell Dupree on the other track. One of the first rock shows I ever saw was Jay Giles. And maybe you can help me clear up the mystery, because for years and years... I couldn't figure out who Jay Giles was. The guitar player. Exactly. And, and I, because you always kind of think, you assume that if, if it's called a band's name, it's usually it's the, the singer. singer. Right. No. But it wasn't. So it was Jay Giles that was, that was the guitarist. Okay. Yeah. And did you ever I, jam with him? Uh, I actually opened up for him, him and Magic Dick, the harp player. Um, they had a band called uh, Jay Giles Magic Dick Blues Time, they were called. I opened for them at the bottom line in New York in the early 2000s and it was great to you know i ended up meeting all those guys except seth justman the keyboard player he actually came to my apartment in manhattan he wanted me to be the lead singer for his new band and he played me some songs and i wasn't quite into him very much but uh it was amazing to hear seth justman playing his songs coming out of my speakers in my little bedroom in manhattan i've been listening to this guy since i was 12 years old you know and i wonder what starts coming out of my speakers Just i crazy. wonder what fate would have happened if like because you you know you're not naming the band after the singer if they just would have named the band the magic dick band <laughs> i wonder what would have happened i'm just curious i mean you never the magic dick band has it rolls off the tongue yeah, a little yeah, bit more a vibe. wait a second that sounded wrong didn't it well, hold on <laughs> let's take a quick break right now uh we're hanging out talking with steve Conte. you have some time steve to just talk a little bit more because we're yeah, gonna take man. a little break and, yeah. and of course uh I, I love catching up on all this stuff but of course we want to talk about uh the new album bronx cheer that's out uh coming out maybe by the time you're watching this it's already out but uh we're going to talk about this album right there that vic just put up called the bronx cheer uh not the bronx cheer but uh bronx cheer by steve conti and we are also going to talk about the system 12 guitar method because we have an absolutely new spanking commercial that uh i think even magic dick would be proud of so vic why don't you run it Hello, Ryan Roxy here from the Alice Cooper Band, and I'd like to talk a little bit about one of my favorite things, playing guitar. Here at the RGA headquarters, which stands for Roxy Guitar Army, by the way, we've put together a guitar learning system that will get you playing and understanding the guitar faster than any other teaching program out there. We call it the System 12 Guitar Method, and it's designed to make the most out of your time, your effort, and your passion for learning guitar. By combining new school technology, old school mentoring, and the number 12, we have invented a new way to teach guitar. And over the past year, we have helped so many people who wanted to start or continue their guitar journey do exactly that. Now, we'd like to help you. There's never been a better time to start learning guitar than right now. If you think it's too hard, the System 12 makes it easy. If you think it'll take too much time, the System 12 will have you playing in 12 weeks. And if you think it's too expensive, the entire System 12 costs less than what one private guitar lesson would cost you at your local music store. Check out the official site or the links below in the description of this video to join the RGA and get started on your guitar journey with the System 12 Guitar Method. Now, let's get back into the trenches for some more rock and roll. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the ride. Mwah! That's it. <laughs> That's the first time I've seen it. So, Damn! Hey, thank you, Vic, for doing that production. But yeah, I think he's right. I, I gotta, you know, adjust the teleprompter a little bit different next time. Um, but it's okay. We have echo problems here on the program. We have some sort of teleprompter problems. It doesn't matter. Because Life having, isn't perfect. Yeah, in the trenches Fridays, which I really, really do love having um, uh, this new Friday vibe happening. And um, 
like I said, we're here with Steve Conti, guitarist, uh, singer, songwriter, producer, and honestly, now I'm I'm finding out pretty much associated with every artist that's on the radio that you've ever heard. So I'm I'm happy about that. Oh, there's um, more. Oh, there's more. <laughs> well, I I do want to get into you know because the some of the other stuff that you've done that really kind of impressed me. I know it's a little bit later years because I don't want need to have to go all chronological order. But um, there was a uh, the work that you did with Yoko. Oh yeah. And I'm not talking about Yoko Ono. I'm talking about oh. Yoko Kano. You've worked with anime and video game uh, sort of artists as well. Video game production. Uh, the lyricist Tim Jensen. How did this all fall? Was it something that happened that you had this credibility from, from being a studio musician? Or how did you meet Yoko and Tim and start getting into anime? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I call it the you hang around this crazy town long enough. You People know, start to notice. <laughs> yeah, scenario. Um, again, like with what happened later with New York Dolls, which we'll get to, um, you know, Yoko... I had no idea who she was. She came from Japan uh, to record some songs for her solo record. And she started asking around, I need a, a male rock singer. Who can, who can I get? And the people just gave her my name. I sent her a tape. This is back when they had cassette tapes and you'd send those out for demos. Of she loved it. I came down, I sang for her. It went on her record and she said, in a couple of months, I'm gonna come back to do uh, a soundtrack for this new anime that they're making. This was 1998, uh, called Cowboy Bebop. Are you interested in doing that? I said, sure, I had no idea how huge it was gonna become. And you know, 20 years later, it's still, if you Google my name, the first thing that comes up is a line of Cowboy Bebop you know, anime videos. It's like, it's more popular than almost Anything I've done, and you, you sang a, you sang on a couple of those songs as well. Yeah, right? I sang on eight of eight uh, tracks. Well, let's see, four for uh, Cowboy Bebop the series, I think. Uh, two for the movie. There was a Sony like actual uh, full length film, um, and then her next series was called Ghost in the Shell, which they've done uh, a live action uh, movie for with Scarlett Johansson recently. And um, also, I think there's a series, animated series now on Netflix. And Cowboy Bebop just came out with a live action series. I don't think it's on yet, but that's going to be happening. And then there was another one called Wolf's Rain that I did a bunch of songs on. And then, you know, people started passing my name around again. And I did Sonic the Hedgehog, you know, that, that video game. I did a song on that with. So when you're in Will the anime Lee. scene, when you're in that anime scene, it, are, you know, are you part of the franchise now? Do, do people just kind of like go to you and say, okay, I'm going to get Steve because it worked on this other thing. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, let's just use Steve. That might've been what happened with Sonic. Um, but even that was a good 15, so we're, 10 or 15 years ago. So yeah. I haven't been doing a lot of that stuff lately. Uh, I did like a reunion with Yoko and her band um, last summer during lockdown. She actually flew me to uh, Tokyo a couple of times and I did like live concerts with her and the band there. Um, While the lockdown was going on no, here. No, no, no. no but yeah. Before lockdown. Before. Like okay. in yeah. 2009, I did the, the last live thing there. 2001, I did the, like the premiere of the movie and that she did a, a uh, live concert there at Shibuya. Yeah. But, um, Shibuya. Yeah. yeah. Shibuya. I know the, the, the Lexington queen. Isn't, isn't that club? Isn't there a bar around? In, or is that the other part of Tokyo that I shouldn't, oh, that I shouldn't Rapongi? know about? Rapongi. Rapongi. That's what it is. Oh, Rapongi. Rapongi. Yeah. There's a place yeah. called the Lexington queen. That's a, uh, you know, we shout out to the owners of the Lexington queen. They always give us a uh, very good service, uh, big bottles of vodka and then the next day you don't really remember what happened mm -hmm. i remember enough yeah. i remember enough nothing bad but yeah, yeah rapungi is the, is the dirty place um, <laughs> <laughs> where you can get yourself in trouble it kind of goes repugnant repugnant Rep yeah, yeah rapungi <laughs> so yeah but that, you know I, I would do more but uh i haven't gotten the call lately but yeah, i understand it's like i guess it's like the music business and everything else you know they sort of go with well, what's popular these days and that was 20 years ago and you know i i people are i see them tweeting all the time they, 
they're making a Cowboy Bebop, you know, remake uh, live action on on uh, Netflix. And how can they do it without Steve? And I'm like, you know what? <laughs> if they call me, I'll be very surprised. But you know, music has changed since then. Voices have changed. They what probably about want Steve. Got to get yeah. Steve back on hey, there. Hey, you know what? Here, here, here's the arc of a uh, of a studio uh, singer, right? It goes. Right. It goes. Who the fuck is Steve Conti? <laughs> get me Steve Conti. Get me a young Steve Conti. Who the fuck is Steve Conti? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. The rise Woo! and fall of Steve yeah. Conti. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, the thing is, we are going global because Steve Conti is not is way more than just NYC. When we started the interview, I thought I was like, we're just going to talk about New York and East Coast. But now we, we've gone down to Tokyo. But I'm going to go all the way up to the North Pole because I was watching something as well uh, that you did with this artist called Angelina Jordan. Oh, you play, you play guitar. You play guitar for her. Folks, if you haven't seen this, this is, one, again, one of those videos that you just kind of look at and you go, how the fuck did that happen? How did that voice come out of that person? And I saw you're sitting right there, this artist, Angelina Jordan. Um, I don't know if, if every, I mean, obviously she's big in the circles, but do, does everybody, am, am I just, have I just been living under a rock? Because I, I hadn't seen that video until today. And then you basically see like a 12 year old girl eight. sing, eight year old girl <laughs> she was sing, eight. like Billie sing, Holiday. Like Billy Holiday on The View, it's insane. Yeah. And what? How did that whole situation come about? Uh, that was the Rosie O'Donnell show. So um, I got the call to uh, to play with. Yeah, I mean, my friend was the technical guy. Um, actually, my lawyer. <laughs> her husband. Right. Her husband worked at the Rosie show. Uh, doing the all the technical like sound stuff and i guess you know angelina she had won like norway's got talent like uh, a bunch of times all right and she's kind of all grown up now she's uh she looks very adult these days okay uh, I've seen but, some, but she's if you watch this space. video if you go to that video and you see the the voice that comes yeah, out of her it, it's incredible uh, yeah. you know she's eight years old and you know i had no idea what to expect they said, you know, come bring your acoustic guitar and, and um, you know, she's going to do a jazz tunes, Fly Me to the Moon. I'm like, okay, I know that. I played it with my mom. My mom's a jazz singer. You know, I, she. In fact, she, in fact, earlier in the podcast, Vic put out uh, an album cover that I believe was from your mom of yeah. the album. And maybe it might have been that song, right? Yeah. Uh, no, she does a bunch of other standards on here. But yeah, that's my mom back in the day. Musical background, yep. whether it's your brother yeah. or your mother. And yeah, your father, so, too, right? Your father yeah, was my dad musician. had a great record collection. He had all the Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Wes Montgomery. That's where I heard all that stuff from, you know, when I was five years old, six years old. And uh, so, you know, I knew the song anyway, and I, I knew all those standards anyway, and there was no problem. But I had no idea what to expect when this girl opened her mouth and it sounded like Billie Holiday, eight-year-old yeah, with like a, a tattered dress and bare feet, you know, like she had such a vibe too, you know, and her hair was kind of teasy and, and um, yeah, it's Google it. Rosie O'Donnell show, um, Angelina Jordan, fly me to the moon. You'll, no, it's you'll definitely, see her, it's definitely worth the watch. I was like, I was blown away. I was like, what? Yeah. What's yeah. That was, that, was like a, that was a weird one off thing, but that's another one of those, you know, hang around this crazy town long enough. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it. So the thing is, I'm going to get back into the nitty gritty world of rock and roll because you've been also been associated with a couple of uh, at least the genres that I love of rock and roll. Some of the most influential bands, uh, one of them being the New York Dolls mm -hmm. and the other one being which had some of the same members of uh of the New York Dolls that eventually went on to Michael Monroe's band, his solo project. They both have a definite uh influence of of like for for me and obviously had had to have been for you now you didn't know you didn't really know you were going to be playing with um johansson back in the days when he'd come and jam with you as buster poindexter oh. but but how did it end up happening that you end up being in the new york dolls uh another one of those you know crazy town stories um 
David uh, apparently had gotten the call from Morrissey to uh, put the dolls back together. Yeah, people have been asking him for decades, you know, put the dolls back together. Arthur Kane would have loved it. You know, Sylvain would have loved it, but David always said no. But for some reason, I don't know if David sort of had the idea that, you know, he wanted to get back together with his old friends or, or what the deal was. But uh, good thing he did because, you know, as we know, Arthur passed shortly yeah, after. Arthur, the, uh, unfortunately, the I don't think Arthur was able to do any uh, – was he able to do any of those shows with you? Because I, your well, brother he ended the, up – He did the very first one. And okay. And that, that was – originally it was just going to be one gig, right? So Morrissey talked David into it. David finally relented and said, okay, I'll do it, right? So – he called uh, a bunch of respected guitar players in town, New York, that he had worked with. Jimmy Vivino from the Conan show, uh, who he had played with. Um, Larry Saltzman, this other guy, who, uh, great guitar player who played with him, Harry Smith, his acoustic blues band. And both guys gave him, they said, I'm going to give you one name, call Conti. He's the guy, he's got the right look, he's got the right guitars, he's got the right amps, he's got the right attitude. Don't call anybody else, just call him. So David called me, we had lunch. We met at a diner. Uh, he had half a cantaloupe. Very <laughs> that's very, hey, wait, wait. That's very taxi driver. She had an apple pie apple pie with a slice of cheese. <laughs> Amazing. Are you Travis Bickle? Did you Travis Bickle him? <laughs> I don't remember what I had, but I do remember what he had. And at the end of the conversation, you know, we never played a note of music together. But at the end of, the, of our hangout, he was like, uh, I took it. Uh, I took the liberty of making. Uh, let me see if I can have an envelope here. He's like, I took the liberty of uh, putting this together. You want it? And he hands me this like envelope full of uh, sheet music and lyrics oh, and a couple <laughs> of CDs. And he's like, you want to do this gig or what? I was like, okay, sure. So no, no audition. So, London. so you know, no audition, no jamming. Um, he just based on the the recommendations of these two guitar players. Wow. You know, we did it. So we started rehearsing in New York with Brian Delaney and then uh, our drummer and Arthur and, and Sylvain, which was amazing. You know, like yeah, I felt like I knew Sylvain guy. my whole life. Yeah. Because Sylvain, uh, I had been hearing his name since I was like 15 because do you, do you know the history of the Dolls? You know, Billy Mercia, their first drummer who died before no, Jerry tell Nolan? The, no, tell me the history of that. Because I, yeah, I knew Jerry from New York. Yeah, yeah so around the, the scene the the oh nice photo there i never saw that one um hmm. the very first drummer in the dolls when they first started getting their notoriety was a colombian kid called billy mercia who sylvain went to, the, to high school with and who actually he told me they they set up like a fight they were like you're gonna fight this kid after school <laughs> and and Sylvain and, and Billy Mercia got out there on the on the playground and, and they went, Hey, wait a minute, you're cool. Yeah, you're cool. Hey, let's start a band. And they hugged each other and and next thing you know, he's the drummer in the dolls. Well, he was the guy who when they went to England the first time and played, uh, he took a bunch of Mandrax, which is I guess some sort of downers. And he was uh, the first he was the first one to pass away. Yeah, and he died in a in a bathtub. Overdose. You know, these girls like yeah. poured coffee down his throat, try and wake him up. And I think he drowned in the coffee, actually, not in the bath. So, but anyway, his, his Billy's family moved to my little town of Matawan, New Jersey, 50 minutes outside of Manhattan. And his bro Billy's older brother, Alphonse, used to, uh, he was a freaky dude, long, curly hair, elephant bells and big platforms. <laughs> And he would like walk down the highway talking to himself. He was like an acid casualty, you know. Oh, and he laughed up to himself, talking to himself. And he'd go, "Hey man, hey man, you know who you look like? You look like Johnny Thunders." I'd be like, "Who? Johnny <laughs> Thunders? You don't know who Johnny Thunders is?" So he would bring all the records to my house. I was fifteen. Oh, shit. He, he, he gave me some education. Yeah, he brought Sylvain, the Criminals records. He brought Heartbreakers. He brought Dolls to my house. Fucking great. And. Uh, you know, I was more like a. I wanted to be a player. You know, I wanted to be Jeff Beck. I wanted to be Hendrix, Page. You no, know, you, were kind of you told us you were you were studying to be more of a. You know, even a jazz cat. Even a, yeah, a but not not at, this, not at this point. I was fifteen, oh, yeah. sixteen. Uh, you know, I was really into Jimmy Page, really into uh, Jeff Beck, really into Hendrix, Richie Blackmore. You know, oh my God, that where'd you take that one up from, dude? 
That's Richie uh, Fontana on drums. You know who that is? Richie Fontana no. from from uh, Piper, Billy Squire's oh, first band. Of course, of oh, yes, 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 and yes. Paul now, Stanley's well, solo album. Well, yeah, he has, he has Paul Stanley's friend. haircut right there. But uh, I don't know what that has to do with the story of the New York Dolls, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, and I'm playing bass there. But anyway, so so uh, Alphonse, you know, turned me on to all these records, and uh, well, you know, 15, 20 years later, I get the call from David. It's freaky. But uh, so when I met Sill, uh, he seemed like I'd been hearing about his name. I'd been hearing his name for so many years from Alphonse. And uh, and he just he seemed like someone that I had known my whole life. I, right. I loved the guy immediately. And Arthur, too, was just very down to earth. David was always yeah. more, you know, you know, the the lead guy who kind of kept a little distance. But um, reserved. Yeah. But um, you, you must know, have it, felt you know, that, that, that that spot, though, when you started jamming with these guys, the original guys, the same way that I felt when I got to do those shows with the original Alice Cooper band, where you you're sitting back there playing the parts. Um, I was, you know, lucky enough to play the parts of Glenn Buxton, but I'm sitting back here watching the magic happen from the best seat in the house. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it was incredible. I mean, how many, you know, bands let alone New York bands, because there ain't many of them, you know, legendary New York bands could you just step into, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not, not many. I mean, I can't even really name that many. Kiss, uh, how many bands uh, are there that came out of New York? At Zebra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, you know, classic <laughs> bands that we all know and love and, you know. Tell me what you want. Hey, uh, you okay. played with all of them, though, at this point, man. So, yeah. so how, yeah. what what ends up happening? Uh, unfortunately, Arthur can't do more touring after the first gig. So then your yeah. brother uh, comes back. Yeah, but, we, your but your brother can't do the can't do the tour or something like that. And then that is that how Sammy got involved, yeah. or what happened then? Yeah, we did the two shows at Royal Festival Hall, which was incredible. Um, you know, one which was filmed for that DVD. Uh, Morrissey presents the return of the New York Dolls. Um, luckily, you know it was recorded. Arthur's final performance on this earth, you know, and uh, wow, and you know his That's cool. his dream come true to get the Dolls back together, and it was recorded um, and filmed. Uh, so we did that. We did those. We did two nights there in London. You know, sold out. Everybody was there. I mean, you know, I met. Mick Jones and Chrissy Hind and Geldof and they were all just back in the dressing room, you know, hugging us. So oh, thank you. Yeah, do you have pictures of Bob Geldof, Chrissy Hind for the Pretenders, and uh, who else did you mention? You name dropped a lot. In there's, that there's, one. Sorry, did I drop something? <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, there's one of there's, there's, oh, yeah. wow, look at oh, that. that's He's me done. and BP and and Bob. I've uh, done a lot of stuff with Bob. I, I really like that dude. Great Bob guy. Geldof, there he is, there, folks. There's actually so one. Uh, there's one of me and Bob from backstage, uh, Vic, which I'm surprised you didn't nab from my uh, Facebook page. <laughs> See, but, um, pile on, Vic. Look at it now. Vic's throwing up his hands. On, like, Vic. <laughs> even even when the guests start piling on, it's one thing when Roxy does it. My my favorite story is the is the time that Bob Geldof came up with. Uh, with us in Australia to jam schools out, and he almost ended up killing a. Uh, he almost ended up killing an audience member because, you know, Alice has these throwing knives that he likes to, you know, uh, pop the balloons for schools out. Because you've come up with us oh, in yeah. Alice Cooper, oh, you've come cool up and played schools out with us a, a few times. In fact, some of the coolest moments that we've had is when you and Michael Monroe have come up with us to play those uh, that uh, encore of schools out. So. Uh, Bob Geldof comes on stage and, you know, he, of course, you know, before the show, we're like, hey, Bob, do you know the song? He's like, ah, I know it. Of course, it's a classic. Of course, I know it. You know, and then he then he comes on. I don't he doesn't know. it, So he has a teleprompter and he sings it. He's fine. He's good. We got the words covered. But then Alice hands him a knife. And unfortunately, I don't know what your experience with Bob Geldof's knife um experience wielding. is yeah wielding he doesn't have experience with it so he basically throws the knife at a balloon it doesn't pop because the balloon doesn't like uh it, it bounces off the balloon but it but the knife goes into the audience 
Man, and that's a lawsuit waiting to happen right there. Luckily, well, it was Australia, so luckily, you know, they they don't do that down there. They probably with a badge of honor if you get uh, you know a knife in the skull. <laughs> Oh, my so, so good. Um, so, so after that, those shows. Yeah. So, all right. So, Tammy sorry, gets in the band. Sorry, sorry to get off on a tangent there, but yeah, we, we do those shows, and then Arthur gets. We're supposed to open up for Morrissey at uh, Manchester Football Stadium, eighty thousand people. That's like huge. A month later, or a couple weeks later, and um, we are. Uh, but uh, Arthur has been forbidden by his doctors to fly because they thought he had like a really bad flu. Oh, so shit. my brother on two days notice learns the entire show. We play the show with Morrissey, my brother on bass. Um, that's filmed actually. And that's on, that's a, on a bonus part of that DVD, that same DVD with Arthur. So um, after the podcast, all you folks can go down and check out all these videos that hopefully you are, are scribbling down or writing in your notes but it's after the podcast to check out all these videos that uh, Steve Conti is, is involved in. Because now that I'm finding after this conversation, pretty much every other video that's on YouTube is probably involving you in <laughs> one way or another. <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah, the uh, David um, offers my brother the gig. And my – well, uh, hold on. So <laughs> we're, we're mixing – we come home from the gig with Morrissey. I'm in the studio with Kevin Shirley, you know, the, the mixer, engineer, great. Okay. Classic yeah. dude. He, I worked on the Billy Squire record with him and Mike Chapman producing. Um, oh, Mike Chapman. Yeah. Chin and Chapman. Love Mike Chapman. Does, does produce the suite. Yeah. Produce Bl hey, Blondie, Blondie, another New York band. There's a yeah, New York, there's band, a New York that band that we didn't, we, yeah, we didn't talk about. Yeah, that's true. About. That's true. All right. But, uh, yeah. But this is a band of dudes, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you, right, you right. could actually, like. Fair enough. You could actually be in the band and like record on the records and write songs with them. You know what I mean? It wasn't like being Rod Stewart's band and being in the back and no one ever knows who you are. You know, kind of thing. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Um, but uh, I'm in the studio with Kevin Shirley. We're mixing um, the live record for the DVD. We got Arthur's face freeze framed on the on the video screen, and the phone rings, and it's our manager saying Arthur just died. Holy shit! I'm like what? He had a flu. No, he had leukemia. They just figured that out 24 hours ago, and he died within one day. It was like, wow. It's insane. Wow. So that's when David Joe, uh, you know, we were, it was supposed to be the one gig at Royal Festival Hall, but then the calls started coming in, and David was like, well, I think Arthur would, you know, want us to keep going. So my brother couldn't do the gig, and we had a bunch of auditions. I brought a couple of guys. I didn't know Sammy. Sylvain brought Sammy. Okay. I brought a couple other guys uh, that I knew. Um, but Sammy was definitely the right guy, you know? So that's how you, that's how you eventually met Sammy. Yeah. That's how I met Sammy. Um, okay. he was the perfect guy. He knew Sylvain. He had played with Thunders, you know, it was like a no brainer. You know what I mean? He yeah, was yeah. really into the band. I mean, I, you know, before I joined the dolls, I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't really know the music. Kind of like the same thing with Michael. I didn't really know the music. Um, you know, heard the name a million times. You know, knew there were. You didn't know the music. Roll. You knew the genre. You knew the style because that's kind of what you were associated with, right? I mean, you yeah, no, it was. It was not like a huge stretch or anything. I mean, to me, for the Dolls, it was like people say, "Yo, uh, you know, were you into Johnny Thunders?" Or you know, some people just looked at my nose and my hair and they went, "Oh, you were Johnny Wannabe." Like, <laughs> you must have been into um, Johnny oh, Thunders because you have a nose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like Italian from New York. Sorry, it, you know, it's just genetics. No. Um, but you know, I figured I was into Keith Richards and Chuck Berry. I figured you do Keith Richards and Chuck Berry, turn up the Marshall to twelve, and then there's Thunders. You know, so that was kind of my, uh, uh, you know, my mindset for for that gig. Um, and so, you know, Sammy joined and we, we kept going and uh, eventually, you know, we did, we wrote songs and. I believe, and I believe Sammy came to a show in Ireland that we were doing, you might, with the dolls and you must have been in the band at that time, but you didn't make it out to that show that time. It was an Alice show or somewhere where, where I, I just met Sammy very, very briefly. But then somehow Sammy 
you know, he obviously digs you. You guys get along with each other. And he brings you into the Michael Monroe family. Is that how you met Michael? Yeah. Or well, was it well the, the Dolls played Finland uh, in 2008. It was my first time in Finland. And it was crazy because uh, the little girls were there sc screaming, you know, with pink hair and green hair and leopard and pink and like for the dolls, you know, these, you know, myself <laughs> included, older guys, you know what I mean? And here are these 15 year old girls. It was just because they were like legends, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah there they are. There, there's all the kids. So, oh my um, God. Yeah, there it is. And you know what? Before we, before the podcast, I was talking, that's a little Steve Stevens vibe from the profile. Come on, man. A little less Italian, hairspray. That's, if that's Steve Stevens, if it, knows. That's you put a can of hairspray. You put an extra can of hairspray on that haircut right there, and you got Steve I, Stevens. <laughs> well, Italian nose, Jewish nose, you know. They say our, our mothers are similar. You know? Well, don't worry. I've got a Polish nose. It's just the same thing, you know. It's a nose. But, uh, it is so, yeah, so, it, so it, it, New York it, it, Dolls it, it, play it, Finland. Yeah, we play then, Finland, it, and uh, Michael comes, and, you know, of course, Sammy says, hey, uh, you know, can we have uh, my buddy you know, Michael come up? from Anti Rocks and play sax on Human Being, which you know has the sax solo on the record. So Perfect. we play Michael's hometown of Turku. Michael comes up, we do that. And, uh, you know, he's very quiet and, you know, he was respectful of, it was Dave, you know, the dolls, you know what I mean? Hmm. Uh, after the gig, he comes on the bus, we meet, no, no big deal, you know, just hello. And he's real quiet. And then, uh, meanwhile, inside his head, he's yeah, getting like this. He's thinking, <laughs> well, I, I think, think him I have Sammy, found my guitar player. <laughs> well, he and Sammy had been uh, talking, I guess, for a while about putting something back together with, with him. And uh, so they called me. Uh, I guess they, they went through a couple of lineups. I think they had Fortis in there for a while. They had uh, Todd Youth. They had and Ginger. They had Jimmy Clark on drums at first. Yeah, From well, I, rem I, I remember that they had also had Dragon is was involved, and you got to play with him as well. And yeah, you got to and, and did so. Yeah, the, the, the first lineup was Ginger, me, uh, Sammy, and Carl. Me and Sammy and Carl have been the constants in the band. Me, Sammy, Carl, yeah. and Michael It's just the the stage right guitar chair has revolved a few times. <laughs> so first right. it was Ginger from the Wild Hearts, then it was Dragon. Now it's been Rich Jones for the longest. That's your boy, Rich Jones. Now, Vic, put up that photo of Rich Jones. I love it because you can give Rich some love I'm, I'm right sure, there. I'm sure there's a better one. No, there's Rich. No, no, there was the one of you guys in the car. Oh, there was that's another a terrible one. one. That's a terrible one. I this know. What are you doing that picture for, Vic? What's the hell? <laughs> <laughs> We're not piling on Vic. For, we're doing it out of love. It's tough love, but it is love. Oh. What, now, what, there you go. There's the photo of you and oh, Rich. I'm, I'm drinking a punk IPA. Focus uh, on that, not my face, folks. I, I, I think like I might be drinking like some a... punk IPAs after this. It's Friday. We got Friday uh, in the trenches. But check it out. Who's Rock Fist? That's Carl. Okay, why That's do you call him Rock lead. Fist? Come on, man. What's the name behind Rock Fist? Is it, Does it have Rose... anything to do with Bronx cheer? Rose Cleveland Cleveland. Cleveland? It's Rose Quist. Rock Fist. Rose okay. Quist. You know, uh, Quist. You know, you're a Swede, honorary Swede, right? I am, so, but uh, I didn't. I didn't know why you called him Rock Fist, though. Well, I, I guess in, in you know. I guess a long time ago he didn't want to be a Rose Quist, so he, someone called him Rock Fist, and it stuck. Yeah, it's Rock Fist. He's even got uh, he's even got drumsticks named after him. Fist sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Rock Fist. Fist sticks. <laughs> okay, folks. Times, again, but. one of those things you <laughs> probably don't want to Google. Don't Google Rock Fist, or you will probably get. Something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. So hold on. Yeah. So we're going to talk about two more things, and then we're going to close it out because I, 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 because at one point when we get on the road again, and we are, I am going out on the road with Alice now, and I'm getting excited about it and packing up and stuff. And I'm sure you're going to get out on the road with your solo stuff and with Michael. We're going to have to do this again and catch up and just see how the road is treating both of us. Yeah. But I want to talk about. Obviously, uh, the last record you did uh, and recorded with Michael and uh, oh, yeah. th this lineup, which is which is Michael Monroe, Sam Yaffa, Rich Jones, uh, you, of course, and 
Rock Fist. Um, that is the One Man Gang album. And you had a lot to do with that record, right? As far um, as yeah, especially um, the lead, especially the lead single. Uh, right? Well, Wasn't maybe, there... you're, maybe you're thinking of uh, uh, Horns and Halos was kind of Ginger left the uh, the band. We okay. went on Century Overdrive, then Ginger left the band, and uh, Dragon joined. And I wrote most of the songs on that album with riffs from Sammy and and Dragon. Um, and that was my uh, Ballad of the Lower East Side. That's from that was the lead single. I was um, talking about the song that you had writ you had written for your own band earlier had released as your own band oh you mean and then and then it gets released as a michael song oh, that's okay. that's because i i think that's kind of cool when the, the lead singer of a band comes in and says you know what i like the song so much that you recorded i'm going to record it again and we're going to make it this version how yeah, did that well, happen that was a good thing that it wasn't the i think it was the second single the first okay. single was uh, last train to tokyo got it that's why you threw me off there brother Sorry, uh, but uh, I don't ha I don't have your career dialed up like what? as well as Vic does <laughs> with pictures. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, that was uh, you know we, me and Rich had written a bunch of songs. Uh, we did uh, Last Train to Tokyo and uh, Hollywood Paranoia and Midsummer Nights um, for that album, and then um, I was like, you know, this it really needs you know, uh, something uh, in that vibe, but also, you know, I was just feeling like that song is even more meaningful right now than it was back in 2009 when it was on my Steve Conti and the Crazy Truth album, because, you know, we're still fucking up the planet, you know, it's, it's called Junk Planet. Uh, it's about, you know, corporations and uh, politicians and, you know, just how this place is going to hell and and we're uh, all the same you know, fuckery yeah oh all yeah that. the same greed and 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 you know of course I, I could hear michael's voice singing it in my head i was like i think michael would really you know kill this song so i brought it and i said what do you think about this one and some of the guys were like nah we don't want to remake you know that song and i was like well you know i don't care let's do it or not and mike but michael heard him was like yes i want to sing let's that so so we did it and uh yeah it, it turned into the the second video, which was like a uh, lyric video with a bunch of graphics on it. But uh, but it was cool. I, I was really happy I love to it. record it. And it. You know, well, it was a, a lot more of an expensive recording, so it sounds <laughs> really big and huge, a lot bigger than my original recording. But your you know, I, I do like my original recording too. Well, of course, man, you got to. They're your babies, man. But here's the thing, dude. We've had a very good talk. We've had a very good interview. But we will be shamed on this next comment because we were talking about New York bands and we were going, blah, blah, blah. And you, you're kind of shaking your head. But I don't know, blah, blah, blah. The Ramones? How yeah. <laughs> Shame on us. Shame on us yeah. for that not being the yeah, first but they're band. Dead. They're all dead. Uh, well, they weren't all dead at that time. But They weren't all dead at that time. No. Yeah. no they made no, a lot but of I was never. I was never going to step into Johnny Ramones. Uh, were, were you not? You know, because that's, that's the one band that Alice, for whatever reason, Alice is, is is never a huge Ramones fan. Really, I do. No. I love the Ramones. I I love them. I mean, dude. I mean, I come on. Did. I, I mean, Rocket I to Russia. So many of those songs. Rocket to Russia. Oh that, yeah, yeah, that's my album. You know, I think almost every rock band owes the Ramones some sort of royalty if they've ever done a photo shoot against a brick wall. <laughs> <laughs> that's every, Which is every that's rock every... band. You know, we, we, we I've never this, seen it. <laughs> we have this. Uh, we have this like inside joke. You know, like uh, whenever a photographer, you know, uh, we get a new photographer, we're like, okay, I know we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna do something really unique, right? We're gonna take photos against a, a chain link fence or a brick wall, right? Brick wall, yeah. <laughs> so it's either folks, you have to pay royalties to the Ramones. Or Twisted Sister is one or the other. That's it. I, I was not a I was not a Twisted fan, but uh, Twisted Sister, another New York band. Well, oh, Long Island, Long Island, uh, well, Different. Long Island, New York, yeah, Long yeah. Island, New York. I know you're a Burroughs guy. You're a Burroughs guy. In fact, you're so much a Burroughs guy. You named the new album. God damn, I'm a good segue. I'm a good segue, right? You named the new album Bronx Cheer. Let's hear about it. And uh, w w when is this album actually 
out to the public? Because I know that you have a couple singles out. I mean, uh, Stevens, Little Stevens Underground Garage gives you massive love. I think yeah. you, have they made you cool song of the year or cool song of the fucking week and yeah. month and coolest song, linear. yeah, coolest song in the world. Um, yeah, I've had uh, oh my God, this is like damn my Anthrax. Third, my We're getting of, schooled by these people. <laughs> this is like my third or fourth record that Stevens played, which uh, you know yeah. I I grew up with his cousins in, in Matawan, you know, and as I've been hearing about him, Oh, little Steve was my cousin or like plays with Springsteen. I wasn't a, a Springsteen fan back when I was in high school. Cause I was into like, you know, kiss and, and T-Rex yeah. and, you know, everything Aerosmith, everything had to have big hair and, you know, everything rocks, that wasn't, you know what I mean? everything that wasn't more folky, you, you more loud and aggressive. Yeah, and you know, I was, I was a kid, you know, yeah. like yeah. the band, you know, like Bob Dylan and the band, you know, those guys leave on helm and then Springsteen, Dylan. I mean, I love Dylan from when I was a kid, but anybody that looked like an old, older dude or that had like short hair or I, I as a 16 year old, I wasn't into it. You know, I just it had to be loud and be in, in my face. So um, I get it. But uh, so Springsteen didn't, you know, of course, now and, you know, for the past whatever, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. I've, I've been into him because he's an amazing songwriter. But uh, so I always hoped to cross paths with Steven. I met him with the Dolls. Um, and he, he was supposed to produce one of our records. It didn't happen. But we played some shows with him. We did the Underground Garage tour in an Underground Garage bus. You know, we played his festival out at Randall's Island with Bo Diddley and Nancy Sinatra and the Strokes and Iggy and the Stooges. And it was, so cool. we had like a little relationship. And... Uh, he happened to hear one of my records and he was like, Oh my God, what is that? And his wife was playing it in the house, you know? And he was like, that's Steve Conti. Oh my God. So he started playing my records and uh, this is like my fourth or fifth record, like, you know, separate album that he's been playing songs off of. But this one is actually on his label. Um, I finished it on my own. I recorded it in New York. I have Charlie Drayton on drums from uh, Keith Richards, expensive winos, replacements, vinyls. Killer so drummer, that's good pedigree, you know, just, good pedigree, the groove, the groove master, you know. Yeah. My brother on bass, and I have Chris Betting on guitar on one song, guesting with me. Keeping uh, it in the family, though, that's good. You got the family still yeah. rocking it. Brother John, yep, and uh, Willie Nile. I don't know if you know him. He's guesting on a song, James Maddock. Uh, lots of great uh, girl, gospely girl singers, and my kids. Both of my boys are have their voices on the record too. There's Willie. Nice. Um, now, is this something where you're perhaps you see some sort of influence of like replacements, maybe have a little bit of a vibe, or maybe Stonesy, a little like you know, uh, I mean, I've always 80s looked, Stonesy. Yes, uh, I like to think that this record is like Stones between '78 and '81, like some girls through Tattoo You. It's like okay. when the Stones were sort of reacting to punk a little bit, but they still had their R and B and blues thing. Yeah. So it's like rock and soul with New York attitude is oh. how I would describe a Bronx Cheer record. It's is, got, is side uh, one is side one all in the key of A like some girls? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, there's a couple of A's. Uh, Dog Days of Summer is an A. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a, a bunch of E's. There's a bunch of songs in the key of E. Uh, rock but, and roll uh, it, 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 when you hear the record from start to finish, you hear it starts out very rough in New York and then it kind of goes into almost like, you know, Jersey Shore, power pop and then mm-hmm. gospel and then, you know, back. There's even a tune that actually someone told me uh, it reminds me of the early Alice Cooper band. So it's cool. Well, so, so it's got a ride. It takes you on a ride. Yeah, it's a ride. Album. But, you know, it's all me. It's all. My, I have a one a co-writer on one song. A really nice ballad, beautiful ballad that I'm going to be doing a video for, called "Flying." Um, okay. And um, yeah, it's it's a it's a ride. What are, what are the late? What's the latest single that you have on it right now? And when is the release date? The latest single is "Dog Days of Summer," which came out in the "Dog Days of Summer." Finally, um, because my last single, my last summary single for that label for Wicked Cool. Gimme Gimme Rockaway came out in November. <laughs> I remember if you look <laughs> at the video, you, if you look at the video, you see me on the beach. My nose is red from the cold. I'm like on the beach by myself, <laughs> you know, pretty much there's no one there. 
picks up a jogger. Um, so yeah, Dog Days of Summer is out now. Recovery Doll was the first single with that virtual reality video, which y'all were checking check out that out home. earlier today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wait, there's something in the chat. Fan of the week. Oh, Vic, you're the fan of the week. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> hold on, hold on. That's that's supposed to be a private chat between me and Vic. Wait a second. Oh, okay. Uh, why am I seeing it? I anyway, um, so yeah, I have those two singles out right now, and then there's going to be a third single coming out. Uh, I think next week, um, the September sixth, right. I believe. Okay. And then uh, there's there's going to be five singles. So I love Rock it. Away. Well, just keep releasing. Just keep yeah. on releasing. Yeah. We, Actually, um, Rock Away is on this album. That was a standalone single. It was only available on uh, on uh, seven inch vinyl and download. Okay. But now it's going to be on this LP. I'm doing um, I'm doing twelve inch vinyl and CDs. So Rock Away will be on that. Um, I have three more singles coming out and two more videos coming out and the record will drop officially in November 5th. But it there you go. That yeah. for a, Sorry, I was so trying to, to pull to that answer out from you. Sorry, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> there you have it, folks. We, we, November grab, 5th. we got the date folks. Steve Conti's album Bronx Cheer comes out November 5th. And not to take away from this man's album, Bronx Cheer, we have a little thing we like to do called Fan of the Week, which Steve oh. wasn't supposed to see oh. because every single week we have somebody from the RGA, which is the Roxy Guitar Army, which if you were following along the whole show, which we're happy that you have, these are everybody that wants to learn how to play guitar, welcome. Come on in. Come on into the RGA. But even if you don't play guitar, every week we choose someone that uh, – shows some sort of Roxy pride, promotes the show, promotes the podcast, and promotes our guest right over there, which has been Steve Conte. There you go. And our fan of the week this week is Vic. It's Kina. No, it's not. Kina, you've been two weeks, but now guess what? Amanda Brown, you are our fan of the week. Congratulations. There you go. She had a nice cup of coffee this morning getting ready for the Steve Conte interview today on Fridays uh, in the trenches. Congratulations, Amanda Brown. You will be our next fan of the week. If you'd like to be, stay tuned uh, for more stuff on my social media because uh, every single week we're going to do a new fan of the week. And especially next week, because we have a, another guest that we'd like to introduce. Uh, who is our guest, Vic? Who is it? It's mystery. It's a mystery. Mystery. We will, we a mystery. Well, we, we will uh, announce our guest on Monday. That's what we did with you, Steve. And I thought the anticipation, we built it up. We built it up. We built it up. And uh, so Amanda Brown, fan of the week, and our next week's guest will be announced on Monday. But you know what? We're here with Steve Conte and his new album, um, Bronx Cheer. So there's a couple things just left. If you got time, I know you got kids in the background. I know, right. you know they're on devices I, right now. I gave them an hour and a half. I got yeah, it. I got it. An hour. <laughs> all right. That's good. Well, we've enjoyed all the stories. I've got one. Okay. One more question for you. The one that got away. Vic? Do you know about the one that got away? Have you heard about the one that got away? No. Steve, do you know about no. the one that got away? I'm trying to just buy time. Is that a fake hand? No, that's the actual, that's the bass player of Fall Out Boy. And we'd like to thank him for being part of our animation, the bass player of, of uh, Fall Out Boy. But the, the one that got away, <laughs> it's not a fake hand. <laughs> it's a rock fist is what it is, Steve. <laughs> um, the thing is, the one that got away is about a piece of gear, a guitar, uh, an effect, something that you had to sell because you needed the money, got stolen because some asshole, some prick took it from the club or whatever, or maybe it was KK Downing that just nicked it, or and then it was, uh, you had to get rid of it, but you wanted it back. What is it? You're the one that got away. 
Do you have anything? Because I see the guitars in the background. Oh, yeah, that's my Zemitis. That's a beautiful and behind guitar. that is my, or my two Hagstroms. Hagstroms, Swedish. those are Swedish guitars. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Um, and, and wait, wait, wait. And, and behind that, uh, I think a Steve Conti T-shirt that's available at steveconti.com, isn't it? <laughs> there it is. Right there. <laughs> Look at that. See, it's got rats. It's got fire. What if hydrants, someone wanted to buy skulls, that shirt? Guitars. What if someone wanted to buy that exact shirt that you've been smelling all episode long? <laughs> Could they buy that exact um, one? Yeah, it's like you know, with <laughs> some some women sell their. Soiled underwear, you know, but I just sell my soiled t shirt. It'll be Sorry, Steve probably. Conti's musk, if you will. And you can you can actually find all those things in his social media and all these types of links right there. As you can see, take a screenshot of that right now while we hear Steve's story of the one oh, that got away. The one that got away. Okay. It. Yeah. So the one that got away is the 1972 gold top. Deluxe. Uh, oh my god, I might have wait, it. Wait, hold on. Was it a deluxe? Which one had the mini humbuckers? That was the deluxe. But but my deluxe got was routed because I, I when I received it, it has humbuckers in it. So I have a I have a seventy two gold top deluxe. I call it my first girlfriend. I call it gold. I, I still have it. Yeah, I do. It's at it's at my buddy John's house. But wait a second, what happened to yours? Because I hope it's not the same one that I own. <laughs> Dude, I, it breaks my heart to even tell this story. Okay? I was the stupidest. It was the dumbest thing I ever did in my life. There was a store in Red Bank, New Jersey called the Guitar Trader. Notorious ripoffs. I don't care if it, they see this because fuck you, Guitar Trader. Um, they saw me like coming from a mile away. They were like, oh, here comes this kid. <laughs> I came in there with my gold top. And I was like, you know, I guess it was the mini humbuckers. It just wasn't giving me enough, you know, power. So they're like, oh, we got, and we got a guitar for you. Check this out. It was an Ibanez Destroyer. <laughs> so it was like, it was like, it was like the Gibson Explorer. It was an Ibanez <laughs> copy of the Gibson Explorer. I did the same thing, Steve. But, and, but, but. But mine was a Stratocaster, the one that I sort of did, the one that got away from me. It was a Strat. It was a 70s Strat. So there you go. So straight what happened? Trade. Straight, straight trade. Straight trade. A Gibson a deal, for deal. an Ibanez. <laughs> Wait. Now, did you get the ice blue or did you get the candy apple red? No, it was Karina. Oh, so you – oh, dude, that's not a bad deal because hey. those Karina Ibanezes – were the those were the uh, models that made Gibson get back into making really good quality guitars because at that time, if you remember, Gibson was that was during the Norlin era, perhaps maybe a little after, but Gibson wasn't making stuff up to snuff. So, so I think the Ibanez V's and the Ibanez Destroyers, whatever they called them, they were like actually really. Not, they were pretty good. I, you might have gotten a deal on it. Is that when the Gibson was making like the Marauder and the Ripper and the Grabber, like the yeah, Kiss yeah, era? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Late yeah, 70s, yeah. early 80s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, do you still... Yeah. Now, wait, do you still have that Ibanez? No, I got rid of the Ibanez. It was a heartbreak. I just... Yeah, I got rid of that. And then I got another gold top. The same... Not the same guitar, but mini humbuckers uh, gold top. I, I bought one later, and... Again, I guess I realized I don't like many humbuckers because I got rid of that one too. <laughs> so I don't have any Les Pauls. I don't have any gold tops with many humbuckers. I have my black, uh, black beauty uh, fretless wonder, which have, has frets in it, of course. Um, it's a seventy, beautiful. Got it. Um, yeah. Signed by Les Paul, actually. When I play, Damn. I played with Les Paul once in, at the Iridium in New York, and he signed my guitar. That little club that he used to play. Yeah, at? yeah. Man, I, I, I jammed with him and his band, and and it was amazing. Well, what, but, didn't uh, you just do it with him and his guitar player for a long time? What was the club that he used to do? Fat Tuesdays. Just, yes, he used to yeah. do Fat Tuesdays. Yeah, him and Lou Paulo. Lou Paulo was what? What a what a chord player, man! What yeah, just a guy. He, he knew every inversion of every chord, man. Yeah, I used to just, go watch he him. Died recently. Oh man, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right. But uh, yeah, that I, I use. Uh, I have that black Les Paul and, and uh, the newer, the white one that 
you've seen some of these photos here that's a uh, supreme thicker chambered body you know, 2005 okay. yeah, yeah but um yeah if you, you want to go down cool. the guitar if you want to go down the guitar road we'll be here all day with no all, in fact we'll say Save the guitar road next time for when we do the road catch up and uh, we can talk about our guitars because I'm actually going to be taking out a couple new guitars on this new Alice Cooper tour. Um, and hopefully at one point, whether it was, whether it's with Michael Monroe or whether it's with your own solo stuff, um, you know, your band and Alice Cooper band or my solo band, somehow we got it connect again because we had a really good time well maybe not as good as that that's a very nice moment with you and alice right there how much did that meet and greet ticket cost <laughs> <laughs> no me and michael went back i love it you had a great time and remember we, we we had a great time hanging out in nashville i mean you know remember oh, when we yeah. were we had a great night together in nashville we went out to a couple bars after we, we played the show and that's right. Mm -hmm. When when the when the original band guys came and and you did the thing with uh, they did the thing with Ezrin at the, the little club. Yeah, yeah, we did that. It was like more of a sort of a conference thing, and that was like actually the second time I had been uh, playing with those guys, and that eventually led into that UK tour that we did with the original guys. But yeah, that was a fun night, man. I remember that. So hey, we got to do it again at one point. But at oh, that point. Bronx cheer has to be out and you got to be uh, all over uh, little Steven's garage. And uh, you know, I know we've had a little bit of echo issues, folks. I, 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 you've been very, very patient with us all day. We've heard a lot of amazing stories. You're going to have to go back and take a right jot down a lot of these names that uh, Steve has been sort of putting out. And there it is. This show, this podcast, complete podcast sponsored by <laughs> Joe Vaughn, Roxy Musk. Look, Roxy's see? Road Musk. Roxy's Road Musk is it's all happening, baby. Because I'm packing up, I'm cutting out to tour. Um, hopefully, we'll be on the East Coast uh, real soon, and uh, I'll get in touch with you when we're we're in the area. I'm not sure if we're going to be that close. I'm not sure if you're going out these days, but uh, if we can, at one point, we'll hook up and talk again. Um, again. Last thing, if you'd like to give some sort of parting words to our um, to our listeners and to people that follow the podcast, um, Steve Conti, there's all his uh, social media contacts right there. But do you have any words of inspiration that uh, maybe has been passed on to you that you'd like to pass on to everybody else that uh, just sort of helps them with their lives and helps you with yours? Yes. Let me grab this someone wanted to see this guitar so i'm going to grab this guitar and i'm going to think for the two seconds that i walk across the room about that all right no problem all right so the, what guitar is that that they want to have the zemitis oh, okay do you now that's another thing do you say zemitis or zemitis is okay. it tomato 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 zemitis zemitis what is it is it zemitis 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 okay See, it's it's wood yeah, yeah. But it's got this beautiful face plate if you ever wanted to be in a uh, Ron Wood cover band, you could be the dead ringer <laughs> right now with, with your hair cut. And of course, of course. And the nose. Well, and the Zemitis, know. yeah. And the Zemitis. Well, when yeah. I saw James Honeyman Scott playing one recently, I was like, why don't I have a Zemitis? You know, I love Honeyman Scott from The Pretenders, one of my favorite yeah. guitar players. And uh, that's when I, bum, I, I called bum, him up. And I said, bum, man. Bum. Um, the reason we're here is man and woman. Oh, yeah. Message cool. of love. Is that what it is? Oh, yeah. What, that, oh, yeah. That, that tone on that song is just, yeah. It was, yeah. It was incredible. The, first, yeah. the whole first album, Tattooed Love Boys, is my, my fave. My first yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway. So, you, uh, Chrissy Hine, did you ever do any shows with her? Uh, I would love to, but I, I haven't. I've been, you know, wanting to be in the Still Pretenders my whole life. <laughs> Still on the bucket list. I got you. But yeah. uh, I, I was I was going to ask uh, about words of wisdom that's been passed on to you, or that okay. maybe you live by. Anything? Um, you know, I just saw a great quote today that that reminded it me it up. that reminded me of what I like to think my philosophy is. Okay, and it's by this guy, a jazz bass player, Charlie Hayden. He okay. said. If you strive to become a good human being with the qualities of generosity, humility, and having reverence for life, just maybe you'll become a great musician. Wow. 
I like that because, you know, there's so many dickheads in this business, you know, people who use you and rip you off and, you know, kick you to the curb when they, when they're done with you. You know, I, I gravitate away from those people. And, uh, I'd like to think that I'm not one. I, I, I have never behaved like that to my knowledge anyway. Um, maybe people who do that don't think they're doing it either, but, uh, I've certainly known a lot of them. So uh, that's you're one you of know, the good guys, man. You're my, one of my, the good ones. Yeah, my key is, you know, be a good person, you know, do the right thing. Um, you know, and and know your shit. Uh, you know, work hard, have a good work ethic. You know, I I worked hard when I was younger. So like I can relax a little bit now because like, you know, I don't sit down and practice like eight hours a day like I used to as a kid, you know, I don't have that yeah. kind of time anymore. But, you know, you put in the time when you're you have put in you, the work dude. when you don't have you, the responsibilities, you know, when you when you're younger and you're coming up because, you know, once you have kids or you get married or you start going on the road, you know, the last thing you want to do sometimes is pick up a guitar after you've been, you know, on stage and on a bus and in a hotel room, or, you know, I got you. So. So, you know, but I you know what, to be honest with you, all the time, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you could quote Spinal Tap all day because that is sort of the Bible of rock and roll. But you seriously are one of the good ones. I, we're happy that we've had you on to tell uh, a lot of the stories of your rock and roll history. And, of course, talk about your current rock and roll history that you're making with the album Bronx Cheer that may be out by the time you're listening to this podcast or will be coming out November 5th. Um, we've been chatting with and talking with and having good conversation with guitarist, producer, singer, songwriter, Steve Conti. And sort of, you know, words of wisdom, that was an amazing quote. Um, one of the most amazing tips that I got this last week to pass on to everybody else um, in the audience, and maybe perhaps you, Steve, I'm not sure if you ever got this, but um, you take two or three sheets of toilet paper, Bef and lay it in the toilet before you go number two, and you'll never leave a skid mark. It's a fucking fact, and I thank my wife for giving me that advice. I never ever knew that until this week, what? and now she she's gonna probably kill me for for just spilling the beans. But literally, if you've eaten a if you've eaten a lot of beans, put two or three sheets of toilet paper. Down in the toilet before. Do you mean now, it, it doesn't leave a ring in the toilet? Or are you no, talking about it in no. your underwear? <laughs> no skid marks. Skid mark free. And it is a charming end to the show, Kathy Grant, because I can't believe that we I had to tell that story because it's like that. It's sort of information that like you, it's a no brainer when you think about it in retrospect, but you've never tried it. And I tried it. It works. Perfect. There you go. But that'll be our whole next wow. week's episode with our mystery guest. And of course, Amanda Brown, which is the perfect name, Amanda Brown. You are a fan of the week all week now with that amazing information. There you go. Vic Chalfon has been our producer. We've been riding him all Friday, but you know what? He's done a great job. And everybody else in the RGA, uh, you've been spectacular in the chat. And anytime you want to tell 10 more friends and get this thing rolling and rolling and up and up, and uh, we appreciate it. But Steve, we'll see you out there on the road somewhere. Steve Conti, guitarist. Hey, Have a great one. Thanks so, so much for being on. Everybody else, we'll see you next week. Enjoy the ride, folks. Bye. <laughs>